Two one. All right. Welcome to another episode of Trading WTF. Uh, today we have some fun guests over here with uh, Vladislav Bryken and Brad Alexander. Our two guests have dedicated most of their lives to the financial markets. Both have traded professionally in different capacities. In this episode of Trading WTF, we will dig into technical analysis techniques that focus on supply, demand, level two pricing, and liquidity, and a whole bunch more. I'm Michael Bookbinder, uh, partner at Scandinavian Capital Markets. I'll do a little intro for Vlad and Brad. Vlad started his career in 2014 as a proprietary trader, later becoming a quantitative analyst for a currency fund. Shortly after he moved into a portfolio management role for asset management firms in South Africa, he modeled and managed currency trading portfolios for their high net worth client base. Since 2020, Vlad has been heading Cypher, a quantitative firm specializing in alternative asset classes. Cypher develops trading strategies and quantitative solutions for institutions that intend to diversify into uncorrelated alternative assets and seek to optimize their risk, return, and revenue matrix. Brad became fascinated with the currency markets from a young age, has been trading for decades. Not four decades, but four decades. <laughs> <laughs> He is a professional Forex trader, and his forte is fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and liquidity mapping. Brad is the founder of FX Large, a company that is creating compelling content for capital markets. FX Large is, a, is an agency providing white label content for brokers. Brad does videos, webinars, and voiceovers in English and Spanish. He did an amazing job producing videos for Scandinavian capital markets. Over the years, Brad has consulted numerous brokers and trading technology development firms in numerous areas. It's kind of like when you go to the movies and you hear like that voice behind the scenes, you know, giving the information for the previews, and this is what's going. This is what's going to happen. And that, that's Brad's <laughs> voice in all those uh, videos for trading that you've probably heard this, this movie theater voice. That's Brad. So you probably heard his voice, but now you get to see him. Very good. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. CFDs and FX are leveraged products, and your capital may be at risk. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, that sounds pretty. <laughs> that, that's the one. That's the one. Okay, that's, thanks. That's exactly it. Um, I guess let's give you guys a chance to um, just add anything else. If I miss something from the introduction, Vlad, Brad, you go first, Vlad. Yeah, I mean, no, it's short and simple. I think it's uh, it's on it's two points for me, so I'm pretty happy. Okay, perfect. Brad, anything I miss? Any disclaimers? Yeah, I, I like to. No disclaimers at all. No, never, never disclaimer. That's that's for uh, that's for regulated people, <laughs> yeah, like you. Yeah, um, you I okay. People ask how long you've been trading. As you said, I used to trade the peseta. Google it if you don't know what that is. Oh, so, what the heck is it? <laughs> it's the, what's the peseta? No, we used to. I mean, literally got involved in trading and trading and trading the hard way long before there was any uh, sort of online trading. Literally sending money back and forth through banks. Uh, in those days, you could get accounts anywhere: Swiss accounts, Spanish accounts. So we were doing it that way, and uh, it was nice to be able to make two thousand Canadian dollars on a simple transaction between Zurich and. Um, and Toronto over a period of a month, things like that. So, um, I, I must say, I never lost any money doing that. But it was it was hard. Uh, then when online trading came and uh, came on board, it was uh, good fun. Then uh, got involved with everybody losing money. So, <laughs> you know how and it then goes. Then it got even harder. Okay. It got even harder. Yeah, yeah. So lots more distractions. So. Um, yeah, and uh, very quickly, I got involved in making videos working on the B2B side um, for customers. And I said, look, let me let me do your marketing for you. So I started making videos uh, and I've just gravitated into doing really nothing else but that. Um, people come to me because uh, I've got the training experience. Uh, I, can, I do my own copywriting. I've got a, a voice, fortunately, as you pointed out. Uh, and I love doing it. So there you go. We kind of answered like the next question. How did you get oh, involved sorry. in trading and what attracted sorry. you? But what what did attract you to trading? Because uh, you mentioned how you got involved, but what attracted you to it? Well, I mean, as it says in my, my profile somewhere, literally as, as a child, I remember hearing the news. And I'll never, never forget this one news story um, that the Italian lira had dropped because of a scandal in the government. And I thought, well, if it dropped because of the scandal in the government, won't it go back up when the scandal gets fixed? Um, so I followed the newspapers for a few weeks and found out that, yeah, so that was my first experience with fundamental analysis without even knowing what it was called. 
Um, and even hearing news as a kid on, um, you know, XYZ company. In fact, I, I remember one Canadian Tire, you know that, uh, big shop in Canada. Um, their sales were bad, so their share price dropped. And I thought, okay, well, if their sales get better, their share price will come back up, won't it? You know, really basic stuff like that as a kid. And I just kept following the markets, played with the stock market, uh, even as a teenager, and then just just evolved there. So that's that's how I got involved in it. And um, yeah, so uh, obviously take into account fundamental analysis every day that I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so that's, and I got involved in online trading almost by accident. I went to what I thought was a networking event and it was actually someone selling courses um, in a hotel room in London many, many years ago. And I thought, I looked around the room, there's, no, there's nobody in this room that can afford 2,000 pounds for a weekend course anyway. But I was fascinated by what I saw on the screen. I said, this is what I've been doing anyway, but now I can see it in, in a visual form. So then I got hooked and then uh, then really got into it seriously and then got, got into B2B. And I mean, now I'm doing uh, education, I'm trading, uh, as you know, as I said, providing videos for, for brokers like you, like yourself. Um, so there you go. If you want to learn how to use a platform, how to use any of our special technology, we've got videos on all that stuff. Um, Vlad, how did you get involved in trading and what attracted you to it? Yeah, I mean, I sort of wish I had like a, a genuine story of how, why I wanted to trade, you know, actually being interested in markets, but I did it for the money, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> like most of us. Yeah, you know. Um, Just don't become people, a douchebag, all right? I'm already a douchebag. <laughs> 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 no. Um, yeah, I mean... It, Mostly the money and the freedom. I mean, it was sort of like a fluke of how I got introduced to it. We, um, I think it was like in 2011 or 12, sort of when I remember the first uh, electronic broker coming into South Africa. It was like largely unregulated back then in, in like the CFD space. And somehow getting a hold of like a demo account, playing around with that, funding an account, making a lot of money, just totally by accident and uh, losing all of it. And I think I ended up owing the broker money. I think that we didn't have like negative stop uh, or negative like loss protection back then. So it, it, it gave me sort of like that feeling of like the freedom aspect of it. Like I can make this much in the short amount of time, live the certain like lifestyle. And that's uh, sort of what took me forward as things progressed, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and I started taking it a bit more seriously. Um, uh, I got more interested into the, 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 the modeling and the statistical side of it and uh, actually learning the, the, the mechanics behind the market and applying uh, that sort of systematic mindset to it. So um, I think it, it transferred from, from, from making money and freedom to actually trying to understand <laughs> the math behind it. And uh, yeah, that, that's what interests me today. So uh, very dull. <laughs> math, 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 would, math would say that that the markets would be a logical beast, but uh, I feel like the markets are kind of random in, in some aspects. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's uh, totally unpredictable to some degree, I suppose. Um, but Unless yeah. you got to come up with your own equations and the math supports it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a trial and error type of thing on my side, at least. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not as good as I think I am, but. Uh. Uh, well, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll be able to discover the black hole soon enough. And uh, well, no, I'm watching a Netflix thing on the black hole. So okay. maybe all the math in the world and they still can't find it, but maybe we'll get there soon enough. Yeah. Um, I was, so leading off forward, um, Vlad, uh, prop trader, quantitative analysis, uh, analyst and portfolio manager are terms that get thrown around a lot. Um, can you explain these roles and how they are different? Yeah, so I mean, like there's, I suppose there's different uh, like subcategories, I, I suppose is what I would refer to them as under like prop trader, a quant and then a PM. Um, but essentially like prop traders is, is someone that uh, works for a firm, be it a, a bank or a brokerage. Uh, whereas that bank or broker or whatever firm wants to uh, participate in the markets outside of their primary sort of um, uh, commercial uh, approach. So they're taking their firm capital and giving it to individuals, let's say, to, to directly trade that in the market. So they can either be market making uh, strategies or um, 
what do you call them, speculative strategies. So from my perspective, I was just trading firm capital on the speculative side of it. So just trying to make money on top of their money. Um, quantitative analysis um, basis, you're just taking data. You're, you're mining all that data, you're, you're cleaning it up and you're just trying to see how you can um, create models essentially that assist the uh, firm to either manage risk or to identify proper, uh, profitable opportunities. On the quant side as well, you get front and back, off, back office quants, I suppose you can call them that. So essentially from what I did again, I was a back office quant, uh, if you want to call it that. So essentially my job was just researching and creating trading strategies that were then passed off to the trading team, was used from that. Um, and the PM side of it or the portfolio management side of it is um, uh, a little bit more client centric, I suppose. So a portfolio manager is just responsible for um, investing a firm or a client's assets, I suppose, and implementing a strategy or implementing those assets across a strategy in accordance to a mandate. So essentially what I did as a portfolio manager is um, I created a product for an asset management firm in South Africa, a currency product. Uh, they marketed that to their high net worth individuals. Um, we uh, explained the strategy to the individuals. They gave us the mandate to allocate their funds to the strategy. And then I managed the strategy actively and obviously try to deliver returns to the clients whilst also managing the client relationship side of it. So I hope I uh, sort of answered that question. Yeah, definitely. I was going to also ask uh, if you can explain more about the math you use around quant models and thesis. Yeah, uh, just generic things like uh, algebra, <laughs> calculus, stats, probabilities. Um, you have to understand market mechanics, I suppose, or, or the, the mechanics of, of the actual assets that you're um, analyzing or trading or whatever the case is. Um, it, it's such a generic answer because there's so much you could do, but I suppose anyone sort of wants to get indicators or do you create your own uh, way of looking at things yeah so we create our own indicators where we actually do create uh, indicators i suppose um but it's mostly price point dependent or time dependent data that we utilize okay um, we very rarely like um utilize a um like a generic uh, like i don't know uh, moving average type of thing or or a histogram gotcha okay cool are you gonna put oh, sorry go for it, brad no i i have I'm a, a question i've been dying to ask vladimir before we got on as as regular as regular traders we had difficulty and everybody would would admit this difficulty during the four years of uh, the orange one donald trump in the white house between tweets were screwing up the markets did you find it difficult with the markets bouncing around like that running your uh, your algos um from period of 2017 to 2019 um that's like the closest that i can get to that sort of time frame uh we we actually did quite well <laughs> so yeah you got the, ma the, the magic sauce <laughs> yeah last year we actually got um like hammered quite quite decently uh by the market but um yeah during during that time we were doing all right okay oh curious i'm just curious <laughs> Come on, tweet again, tweet again. Let's get some no, tweets. No, no. Yeah, for yeah, for you, for the rest of us. I mean, I remember seeing on Bloomberg, you know, the, the big boys. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, but they literally, um, the investment manager at Goldman Sachs, who handled most of Asia and, and so forth, saying, my clients are asking me, where are we going? I said, we don't know, uh, because they were just so confused by <laughs> by the markets, which was being driven by a Twitter account. <laughs> anyway. By, by the Donald, I, yeah. I, I, I digress, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I was I was waiting to hear for some calculus and logarithms, but phew, okay. Thank God, those things mess me up when doing that kind of math. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's 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 a very like broad spectrum. So I don't really know how to give a detailed answer. Um, also, funny thing is, like I did really really badly at math in school. So 
my, <laughs> my, my sort of pathway to, to actual trading, I suppose I didn't like mention it was, I don't want to say self-taught, obviously, because that's not entirely true. But I mean, like I came out of, uni- uh, out of high school with like no plan really, you know, like no mathematical background, no coding experience. And I was sort of like lucky enough to um, uh, find a mentor. And I suppose I should have answered this in the first question. Um, but uh, yeah, I was I was mentored by a guy that was a prop trader for, for some banks over in Europe, Germany, I think specifically. Um, and he pretty much taught me um, everything that I know today to some degree. Um, so I don't think I have a, a deep enough understanding to, to physically explain all the math that goes into it. I just know what I've been taught and how to apply it. <laughs> and I think that's sort of where the buck stops for me. Yeah, yeah. And Brad, you previously consulted brokers on finding liquidity solutions. Uh, what do you feel most traders don't understand about order execution, liquidity? Um, yeah, when I was in, involved in that side of the business, it was a long time ago. And, um, you know, as Vlad was pointing out, in, in, in fact, it's funny, one of the first brokers I spoke to way, way back when was in South Africa. And it was, sorry, not, not brokers, sorry, traders. And they were trying to find brokers in those days who were actually honest. There was a lot of slippage going on, literally skimming profits. It was crazy. These days, to answer your question, a lot of traders don't even need to worry about that because as you know, Michael, very well, more than most of the business is so well, I, I use the word well, so well regulated, or some would say heavily regulated, I'd say so well regulated, that they don't need to worry about that. So from my uh, experience in selling liquidity, we, we had brokers coming, I won't even say where I was working at the time, um, selling liquidity, but uh, we had some brokers coming to us who were literally looking to create a fiddle. Um, and of course, we just say no, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story later because you were, you're going to ask about PitView. We, we had a, even binary options companies phoning and saying, hey, I want to use your product. Um, well, wait a minute. Why do you want to use your product for binary options? It's actually going to help your traders. No, we want to slip the market when we know there's volatility. You know, so <laughs> and that was a few years ago. So it, fortunately, these days, there's a lot. Well, I say a lot less. Hopefully, there's none of that going on these days. All, and again, I'll go back to you, Michael. You're 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 right in it. You're a broker. Uh, you know the regulations. Um, I think one thing to answer your question about what most traders don't understand about order execution. I still see. I still hear traders saying, "Oh, this broker is a B broker. This broker is an A broker. They're taking the other side of your trade." Well, who cares? If you're a good trader and you're you're learning how to trade, and they're giving you proper execution, which you'll be able to see with no with no slippage, then you know, if they're a B broker, then you go ahead and take their money. <laughs> Why worry about? Uh... Well, yeah, well, actually, like, you know, what I'm coming to notice is with all the regulation coming into play and the oversight, it's kind of washing out the, the bad players. And Exactly. You know, oh, yeah. You, you, I guess the key thing is, can you withdraw your money from that place? And are you going to have issues with it? Like, that's like the, tell, the telltale sign. If you, if you yeah. can't withdraw your money, if people are complaining about withdrawals, just just run away. But in terms of, uh, you know, uh, someone being a market maker or whatnot, th- those could actually be like some of the better fills that you get these days, as long as they're uh, able, like they're sophisticated enough to go and cover uh, the position in the market, or they have enough uh, trade flow coming in from both sides to to kind of match you and fill you uh, from the other side. So it's not the worst thing these days, as long as uh, you can withdraw your money. But you know, I, exactly. I still prefer the, the, the STP model because, you know, there's no conflict of interest over there and no one's going to c- complain about a mistake um, saying, oh, sorry, uh, we couldn't fill you, so we had to reject your trade. That's, uh, that's the frustrating part. But I think they're getting better and better and slowly uh, it'll be a change. So, yeah, but the, you, the first thing you got to see is, can you withdraw your money from that place? And if there's any issues, just, just run away because, you know, like the, the old mentality was every deposit that comes in is, uh, is, is, is money that's going to go into your pocket. If, and, and that's not true. You got to provide a fair place for clients to trade. Exactly. Well, as you know, by by law, they have to have uh, segregated client accounts. I mean, I just I just remembered something is that as the, the the downfall of the binary options business, and I won't name names, but two two larger companies, quite a few, tried to use their technology. And must think about binary options companies. They were really ace on technology and marketing. They really and, and affiliates. They really knew what they were doing when it came to that. 
So why not have this team of people go into into Forex? Well, and, and I'm not joking. I was actually not so much interviewed, but went in to see a couple of different companies about consulting on them, about getting into um, Forex and creating content for them and so forth. And you can't put, you can, you can put sheep, sheep's clothing on the, on the wolf, but it's still a wolf. And it was incredible. Some of the stuff these guys were coming up with, and, uh, and if I can be so bold, l lies, um, that they were coming up with to create their own technology for, for Forex traders. And I said, look, this is, not only is this wrong, it's illegal. Oh, no, no, the regulators won't let us do this and do this. Well, yes, they will. They have, you know. And unfortunately, these guys disappeared as well. So it was amazing that, I guess I'm going through the evolution I've seen in this business um, and in fact, this is a more recent revo uh, evolution of binary options people. Um, I still get phone calls from, um, you know, someone who says they're regulated in Antarctica trying to sell me, you know, one to 3000 leverage. Um, you know, it's, it's just nuts. So getting back to, uh, what traders need to see, fortunately, the regulators are, are keeping it clean. Um, and uh, as I say, in, in many of my videos and webinars, if you're looking for a broker, make sure they're regulated either by SISEC or FCA or ISEC or ASEC or wherever, wherever you're located. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was pretty damn scary. I went into a meeting like probably like in 2011, 2012, I was in a meeting and, uh, we went for a piece of technology, and the guy's like, "Bro, what do you need that piece of technology for? Don't you know? Don't, don't." He's like, "You need to look into binary options." I was like, and he was explaining. He's like, "It's very simple for traders. It's either a yes or a no. They don't have to think about anything. Is the price going to be here or is the price going to be there? It's a yes or a no." And I was like, "Okay, but what happens if um, if if the traders are all on the right side of the market?" He's like. That's never going to happen because you're just going to widen the spread and they're all going to lose. I'm like, oh my god! I was like, so I'm like, so you don't go and cover your things? Like, no, no, no. You just you just play around with the settings and make them all lose. I was like, I was like, oh my god! I was like, let me out of here. Yeah, I was in. Um, I was asked by a broker many years ago, a rather large broker who was offering binary options and forex, and they said, can you do some videos for us? Um, so I, I, I took it upon myself to do a side by side MT4 and, and binary options on a few pairs. And first of all, I said, wait a minute, the prices are different. This, why are the prices different? Um, I never really got a good answer for that. But I did prove <laughs> it was interesting. I did prove that with the, with the same analysis, you could actually make more money on on forex than you could on binary options, and simply by the by risk management. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, depending on the payback, I mean, a lot of the paybacks on binary options, if you want to trade, you got 67% back or 80% back or, or whatever it was on Forex. It's the other way around. If you do your risk management, you could, you know, lose 1% versus blah, blah, blah. If you took the same trades on Forex versus binary options, you actually would make more money on, on Forex. And I was in a, again, on the B2B side, I remember on one London summit years ago, and uh, one of the binary options companies was explaining to a whole room full of, of Forex brokers, you know, what, what it was all about and revenue sharing and so forth. And one of the brokers in the back put his hand up and says, well, how is our risk management work? And the guy said, I'll never forget this. He looked at the audience and says, what risk management? They're going to lose. So this is, this is what he said. And he said, so he realized right then and there, you're not in Forex, you're in gambling. So this is, as you know, the regulators for years struggled with these two, with these two concepts, and then he said, "Well, actually, wait. You can you can manage it. You just actually alter your level of capital in your in the accounts and things like that." He wasn't talking about fiddling, but it, he was clearly talking about a gambling product, which is why it no longer exists um, in our in our world. We're more to do the fact that the, the misselling of uh, of the product than anything else. So, yeah, well, we're we're the, because the. We're, we're, we're coming to kind of much simpler times in terms of people don't want to think. They just want to know the right answer. Gamification is, uh, I guess, maybe binary options was ahead of its time with gamification. But that, that's really where a lot of the trading markets are heading is can you gamify it and make it kind of easy and fun to do? And that's definitely uh, takes a page out of the gambling side. And now you're seeing a lot of that just happen with the crypto space where I saw a notice the other day yep. where... Norway said we don't regulate crypto, so anybody who's saying they're regulated in Norway is it doesn't exist and it's it's false. So right, yeah. Well, I'm sure that was uh, fun for you, Vlad. Uh, what are for? I guess I'm going to throw this one at Vlad. What are alternative asset classes? 
Yeah, I mean, oof. Uh, subjective, right? Um, I'll give my subjective opinion uh, because I think it's like open-ended. But um, if you look at anything that's traditional, like stocks or bonds, um, I'm also going to throw property into the traditional side. I don't know it can be seen as as um, alternative, I suppose. Um, anything on the other sort of side of the spectrum to that, um, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> It's difficult for me to decide because, <laughs> because I always have arguments with, with regulators and compliance officers about what is an alternative asset class. But essentially, in the eyes of um, compliance people, our side is it's something that's illiquid, illiquid something that is um, um, sort of like traditionally meant for high net worths, uh, something that uh, sort of promises high returns to traditionals and uh, something that... Um, Jeez, it slipped my mind. <laughs> but anything like private equity, um, forex, commodity trading, cryptos, I suppose at the same time, um, that that's that's all alternative asset classes. Uh, venture capital, anything that uh, sort of is deemed harder to get into, uh, in my mind. But the way that I the way that I would sort of like deem an alternative asset class and sort of like what we alluded to, what Cipher does, is uh, we look for anything that's uncorrelated to traditional assets. So uh, anything that has a negative correlation actually to to stocks or bonds. So we we don't want our strategies or our portfolio mixes to be affected by what's going on in the world of stocks and bonds. Meaning that um, if uh, if you allocate a certain portion of your money to uh, an uncorrelated alternative asset class, it shouldn't um, experience the same traje trajectory as sort of like your stocks or bonds, property portfolio would in an economic downturn per se. Um, so that's how I would sort of define alternatives. Uh, but yeah, like I said, um, I, I, I have arguments every day with compliance people about it. So I don't really know what a good answer is. Uh, I, I don't think Forex is, is inherently risky. I don't think cryptos are inherently risky either. Uh, you know, like I could put my money into to, to a stock portfolio and lose 40% of it tomorrow. Uh, there, there's absolutely nothing that will guarantee me my capital. So it's a little bit <laughs> all over the place in my mind. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, Forex is, is pretty liquid, but I guess what you mentioned there, the, the potential to lose all the funds just because of using leverage. That's if it's, if, it's, if it's unleveraged, it's less risky. But when you use the leverage, that sort of becomes pretty risky. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose. I mean, it depends <laughs> who's, who's managing the trades, yeah, you know. Um, so that's why I say like a stock standard generic answer of like Forex being high risk or cryptos being high risk is totally, I think, wrong in my opinion. I think it gives people the wrong uh, impression um, or the scams give people the wrong impression too, I suppose. And the whole regulations and what you touched on with the brokers as well and guys like uh, complaining about being booked or trading on balance sheets and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it comes back down to the individual sort of capacity. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting off track here, I suppose. Oh, we can go on any track you want to go. So yeah, it's fine. We make our own track. How's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I've spent, uh, I've spent too, many, too many hours in boardrooms trying to convince compliance people why FX is not risky. So I'm a little bit passionate about this. I've been, I've been shut down every time, just by the way. So <laughs> have fun, man. You got to check all the, you got to check the boxes. You got to ask them, like, you just got to say, what boxes do you need to check? And then you, and then you can figure out how to explain what, what to cross off for them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, still, yeah, still. Compliance is, is, does it check the boxes? Does it fit inside the box? If anything's outside the box, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Yeah, I think, I think like uh, I'll only comment on South African sort of regulations because I don't really know. I think offshore it's a little bit more like forward thinking, but here we're so, um, I suppose archaic is or like antiquated is maybe like the more correct term in the way that we think. Uh, we're, we're like, we're years behind, man. Um, so it doesn't matter what you show people, uh, they'll they'll still go the, the old-fashioned way, or they'll put all their money into a scam, and they'll lose. Their, so we don't have a good middle ground here. It's like it either goes one way or the other. That's the problem. You can be honest to clients, and then you can tell clients what they want to hear, and they're always going to 
by what they want to hear and not what's what the truth is and it's uh that's the frustrating part, especially like when you're an honest business person. So yeah, there there's still a lot of brokers who are selling high leverage. Um, like, you know, there, I, I can name name one. It's in certain pairs, one to three thousand, as I said. I saw a video last night about some guy selling one to five hundred. And the thing is, I I tell students, you, you don't need high leverage. I mean, high leverage that high leverage for a retail trader, all it does is allow you to hold, run a whole lot of bad trades in parallel, and then blow up your account um you know <laughs> so i mean as well, a professional as a professional every time i've traded professionally it's been one-to-one -one. there's been no leverage um because you know we we understand risk management we know what we're you know what we're trading uh we don't overload it in fact i was actually trading once years ago with them and i realized there was actually negative leverage um it was they said they said it was four to three it was actually three to four we're actually trading less than, than the dollar it was crazy um so I don't know how that worked out, but how the broker set that up. But uh, a lot of times, you well, you know, as a broker, uh, Michael, you know, leverage can be a dangerous thing or, or a helpful thing. Most to most retail traders, can it can be dangerous. And again, I tell clients, any if you see a broker selling you, trying to sell you one to three thousand, he's not trying to help you trade. He's trying to take your money. <laughs> Simple yeah. as that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, I definitely get it, and uh, I've, been, I've been in the business for almost for like wow, like 10, 12 years now, and you know I, I've seen leverage, and then I've seen no leverage, and then like when we try and find the middle ground, everybody wants the leverage. So we're, uh, we're we're working on our license to in in Vanuatu, which is an offshore uh, entity, and we're looking to give some higher leverage to clients over there, but. We're we're still gonna run a fair game and uh, yeah. mess with anything, but you, you just gotta give the clients what they're asking for is is really what I'm finding, and a lot of people are asking for it, whether it's for their own good or not. Um, we just want to serve the client, give them what they're looking for. Um, but yes, leverage is more or less uh, a double-edged sword, and uh, I've seen more people stab themselves with that sword than than yeah. win. So. And and like you said, with using very little leverage or no leverage, there's enough movement in the markets. It's about being patient and just capturing it. Unless you're like a high frequency firm that's trading like in multiple directions and thousands of times a day, like uh, from a lot of uh, studies I've seen, that's that's really where uh, the a lot of the successful trading programs are is from having trades going in multiple directions and clipping little bits here and there, little bits here and there, and always being in the market. And then, and then just, you know, a slow and steady trader is having a, a, some positions in the, in the market using low leverage and just waiting for the pips to come, the points to come. And that's, that's where the money's at. And right now with cryptos, when you're, you're making, when they can move, you know, so, such high percentages in a day, uh, that a lot of people are attracted to that because they're like, oh, I made five percent today. I'm going to make ten percent tomorrow, and and yeah, and if you're going to do that on leverage, that's kind of scary as well. So yeah, well, that's why the, the regulators have uh, put very low leverage on uh, on crypto <clears throat> for those yeah. who are, for those for those brokers, unless you're unless you're you know an exchange. Obviously, you're buying it one to one, um, but that's a you know yeah. Well, I guess that's like the kind of the 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 attractive part on on the uh, on that side on the cryptos because we're we're about to launch some cryptos uh, one to five leverage, and so it's not crazy, but it just allows you to instead of paying the whole fifty thousand for a Bitcoin or maybe it's thirty thousand or thirty five thousand today, but it's you know it's uh, you can get in there with you know one to five thousand and then experience some of that. Uh, uh, up or downside and make a few bucks on that. So that's that's the interesting part for that. But uh, yeah, I get it. You want to limit that leverage because it'll just be it'll it, it would be wild, especially like trying to cover that trying to cover those positions with like one to five hundred, one to two hundred leverage, one to one hundred leverage, and on a ten percent, twenty percent move on a daily basis, companies would be going bust daily. Trying to cover that. Yep. Oh, anyways, uh, continuing on, you mentioned the pit view. Um, you can you previously contributed to a trading tool called Pit View. Why should traders care about level two pricing, and what can it tell them? 
Uh, yeah, well, Pitview was was great. I say it was great fun, and it was developed by a guy called Stephen Cutler in Florida, who I still keep in touch with, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, what it what he had was he had direct liquidity feed, uh, well, uh, not pricing feed, sorry, from fifteen the fifteen largest banks in the world. So it was basically market depth, un, non aggregated market depth. And he created the math to make it um, palatable for for traders. And if you ever traded um, market depth, you you can actually scalp with market depth, but it gives you a headache. It's really hard to follow. And what Stephen did was create take take this data, and uh, check the frequency and the the volumes of not so you can't get volumes on forex, of course, but the the frequency and the the size away from the prices of different bids and asks by the nanosecond or by the tick anyway from the big banks and he created the math to look at it over one minute, over five minutes, over 15 minutes, over four hours, over a day. And it worked. I mean, when I first got involved, it was a friend of mine at El Pari in the United States, that's how long ago it was, said, have you seen this thing called PitView? So I downloaded it and I, and I ran it on the non-farm payrolls one day. And the, it was one of those times when the non-farm payrolls actually did, it was literally like a roller coaster. It, was, it did that. and. It, it, it was the most one of the most amazing things, as you as you know with non-farm payrolls, it can be dead flat with no liquidity, or it can be doing amazing things. And this pit view actually tracked it and actually predicted the ter the reversals every time. And this is on a one-minute chart, so I was hooked. And, I, and so I called um, Stephen, and we spent two hours on the phone, our first phone, phone conversation. So I said, "Look, let me help you," because I think these guys thought that the world revolved around New York. And I said, "Well, actually, it's in forex. It's in London. So let me help you." I was based in London at the time. Um, and so I literally started pounding the pavement, trying to sell this to brokers. And what I found out was it was way too complicated for, for retail traders. We spent the next three months literally paring it down to make it look like, um, you know, something that a retail trader could log on and, and, and get up, put on their, on their MT4 platform. Um, the downside of PitView was it only worked when there was money flowing through the markets. And as, as both you guys know, when there's no money flowing through the markets, you can get you can watch your charts flap around like a fish out of water and, and nothing's really happening. Um, if there's money flowing through the markets, PitView was, was doing amazing things to predict uh, the turnaround. One thing PitView did for me, it would actually tell me when not to trade. I could literally turn on uh, my charts in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, London time. And if, if PitView was saying liquidity is going one way, but the charts are going another way, that was telling me there's not enough money in the market, come back in an hour. Um, so I, over the years, I started do, using it in different ways. Um, near the end, I started using, um, you know, if I was if I wanted to trade dollar CAD, I would set up what we call global view to look at all the pairs and all the dollar pairs and see where the liquidity was going. Unfortunately, um, they lost the feeds because the banks are no longer allowed to sort of broadcast their trades. But we've actually found a workaround, and we're right now in the middle of um, setting up something totally different with a different interface for uh for traders to use and it was one of those things where it, it was a bit complicated for retail traders as you as michael just said you have to give them what they want and, and retail traders want instant gratification they want to be able to see an indicator that will tell them right away um sell here or buy here um pitview took a bit of uh, a bit of brain power and a bit of uh, a bit of work but it did work and it was as we say, it was level two pricing. So watch this space. We're coming up with something. We're going to start testing probably in a couple of weeks to see if it behaves like uh, like PitView used to. Um, but the, the good thing for me, it got me involved in the B2B side. I was trading before then, and then that's when I got involved in B2B side, meeting brokers like like Michael and so forth way back when. And I started my my path going that direction as opposed to to trading. And that's how I got involved in making videos. So PitView was an awesome product. Uh, like I say, we're still we're still trying to uh, make something. Oh, one thing that PitView did, and this is really cool. Uh, Stephen created a uh, a position size calculator for MT4, and I tell anybody and I tell students this: MT4 is the most popular trading platform in the world, but it's probably the only platform that that doesn't allow you to calculate your position size. Which to me, to the, to this day, is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like. You know the the videos I made for for Scandinavian for Michael are all all C Trader and it is brilliant for for just that. Um, you know you can manage your risk very easily with with C Trader and a lot of other things. Whereas MT4, you really have to go onto other people's websites. You have to calc you have to do spreadsheets if you want. Um, you know I'm sure Vlad can write these these programs in his head. But for a retail trader, 
um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave my position size at one and click the button and see what happens. Oh my God, I've blown up my account. Um, because that, you know, and I, I do a lot of trading and, and trading psychology. And one of the things, uh, that we talk about is position size that is too large. And one of the things that pitch had, we want to redirect it is a really cool tool that plugs into MT4 for calculating your position size and risk. So watch this space. It'll be coming up hopefully in the next few weeks and months. Yeah. Yeah. It was C Trader allows you to see like your your risk. It allows you to say, okay, if it goes this many pips, I'm going to lose this much or make this much. It just lets you kind of really like think about what you're going to do. Like when you're trading on an, on an MT4 or another platform and you're just putting in the units and it's just like, oh, 10 lots. What's that? Well, that's a mil- that's a million dollar exposure in the markets right there. Like, like yeah, you're taking your your ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar account, and you're gonna go put a million dollars in the market by opening those ten lots. I'm just like, you want to really like what is that? What does that mean? Opening yeah, up a million dollars yeah. in the market, two million. Like you, you can easily open up like fifty to a hundred million dollars in the market with, you know, if you have a hundred thousand dollar account, and you're just like, what? What are you doing? So. Yeah, I mean, the, the easy way to do a, 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 a the lazy way to do a trade like that on MT4 is open a trade at 0.01 lots, drag your stop loss to where you want it, take a look and see what the number says, what your risk is, and then say, okay, I want to risk X amount percent, and then I'll just go put another trade with with that 0.1 times whatever. It's a lazy way to do it, but you know it's unfortunate that MT4, again, the most popular trading platform in retail in the retail world doesn't allow you to calculate your position size. So I've got lots of little tr- lazy tricks to do that because retail students and retail traders don't want to mess with spreadsheets. They just, as you say, they, they want, they want to click but, the button and get going. Yeah. So anyway, or, that's my or rant. On the, or on the phone or on the phone to trade, <laughs> trade close. Yeah. Close. Yeah. Yeah. And even, uh-huh. well, even C, C trader will let you do that very nicely on their mobile app. This is not an ad for C trader, even though I do love it. Um, but you know, even some of the uh, the dodgy brokers who have their own platforms will still let let you calculate your risk on uh, <laughs> on their platform. <clears throat> yeah. anyway. So Vlad, most traders watching are probably using platforms, well, all sorts of platforms. They're, they're using TradingView, uh, charting. They're using MT4, and they can even connect their their broker accounts to TradingView. We're going to do that one day soon. MT4, Ninja Trader, C Trader, CQG. Yada yada trader, everything else that's out there. What sort of platform does a quant trader use? Or yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I still use MT4. Uh, I love MT4. Um, I like the the whole discussion about the risk. Also, it's I think it's ridiculous. Um, I actually remember like uh, four years ago, or whatever. We 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 also had to make our own um, sort of like algos. Um, I suppose more so indicators where you could literally click B or S. You know, input your risk <laughs> from the get-go, like one percent, whatever. You click B or S on your uh, on your chart, wherever you want to buy or sell. Drag your stop and take profit, and then the algo would sort of like calculate exactly what your position size would be. And I just feel like that's a little bit redundant when the platform can have that coded into it itself. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like I still use MT4. We try to replicate some of our models in uh, like the MQL language and 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 run them on MT4, I suppose, uh, which we do. Um, but um, on the more sort of like, um, I suppose, fancy side, institutional side, I don't know, I, I don't want to call it institutional side, but let's say it's like institutional side, we, 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 we code our algos and whatever we code them in, and we just directly plug it into the, the, the pricing data or the feed uh, via an API, which is essentially like, if, if people don't know what an API is, it's, it's, it's like a middleman program, I assume is the best way to explain it, which basically connects your your actual trading algorithm, which executes the logic and the framework behind the market. Um, and then the, the API sort of like sends that signal through to the pricing data or the feed, wherever you're sort of sourcing the feed from, whether it's like a, a bank or a Bloomberg or anyone else that aggregates data. Um, so most of our execution is done via an API sort of connection. Um, but like I said, we still use MT4 every day. Love MT4. <laughs> No problem with it at all. Nice, nice. Um, Brad, most instruments, especially those traded on exchanges, are very transparent. Do you think forex trading will get more transparent? 
again, getting back to the, what I was saying earlier about the regulation, um, it, it is and it has. In fact, I was, I was having a discussion the other day about, um, you know, a lot of brokers are launching some of the new crypto products. And it was actually on, on, a, on a chat show with someone. He says, well, why are they, you know, why are they putting Dogecoin and, um, and Shiba on their platforms? And I said, well, it's the same as the trader called FOMO, fear of missing out. It's not just the trader that has fear of missing out. It's the broker. I mean, if if they don't have Dogecoin on their uh, their platform, then they're going to go somewhere else. So, and with with all these exciting, you know, I don't know if Vlad would call that an an alternative asset, um, things like Shiba and Dogecoin and whatever that really <laughs> that may or may not have any purpose in this world. Um, you know, for a broker or an exchange to be offering this, they really have to be following, still have to be following regulations. So. Um, you know, they have no choice but to be transparent. I mean, we, we could go on a rant about right now about people like Robin Hood. Um, and, you know, you're, you know, we're, we're, we're both Canadian. We've, we've seen the, the, how things are di- done differently in North America. Uh, and it's actually a bit funny watching the, uh, uh, what's been happening with, uh, with Robin Hood. Um, from, uh, from the other side of the world, though, I think it, it shows you that um, obviously, the, you know, the UK, Europe, Australia and various other places like that are far more advanced in their retail trading, um, and I think everything I think everything is still transparent. Um, you can't, you, as you know, in forex you don't have a, an exchange, so you're you're relying on on uh, faking faking the volume. But there's really no, um, you know, as a broker that you have to report everything you do, every single trade, every single client, every single conversation. You have to keep a track, keep track of, um, because the bro- because the regulators require it. Yeah, well, for for me, uh, I'd say the way the way we look at things is, I guess, I wouldn't say it's fear of missing out. I'd say, over the past like you know, three, four years, five years, we've kind of seen um, traders kind of come and go and understanding where traders are going in terms of that in that respect is we're like uh, we're kind of thinking uh, you know where's the new generation next generation of traders going to come from and all of a sudden with you know covid and everything we've seen a spike in new traders like a, like more traders than we could have ever imagined coming into the market but there's a difference between institutional traders and retail traders. And um, the on the retail side, yeah, you want to give them everything that they that they want and stuff like that. You got to capture their attention and uh, and get them because right now on on the flip side of things, you have all these cryptocurrency brokers or exchanges that are now offering currencies to trade and everything like that. So the industry is kind of getting. You know, it's it's topsy turvy. It's like okay, they're coming into your space, they're going into your space, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, if you if you don't add those things, all of a sudden you're gonna have all these uh, currency, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges offering currencies, and then they're gonna offer other sorts of derivatives and things like that. So, if you don't go into that space and and offer those products, then all of a sudden you just become obsolete in in some regards. So. Uh, fear of missing out um, I don't know I think it's just a natural evolution where you have to if you can offer those different asset classes and pairs um, I think you got to keep the interest of the audience wherever they're going and more from our side the target what where we're really looking at on the crypto CFDs is we're, we want to focus on Bitcoin Ethereum some of those major ones and and we want to attract um, some of those uh, crypto hedge funds and stuff like that. And uh, off because really, whatever those crypto funds are doing currently is, they're just saying you don't want to buy uh, cryptocurrency and worry about the um, holding holding the coins inside your wallets and dealing with all that stuff. Why don't you invest with us and you know we'll we'll buy for you. And, and really, most of their strategies are buy and hold. As opposed to you know, or or maybe they're cost averaging. Oh, oh, it's going down. We're going to cost average and and, and continue to keep buying, and maybe they sell a little bit here or there. But with CFDs, we offer a, a convenient way for them to hedge out their portfolios on the downside risk without having to sell their Bitcoin here or there. So, 
Uh, and as well as if they were to go to the futures exchange, they have to deal with contracts rolling over, turning over. Uh, there might not be um, the leverage component uh, that's easily accessible for them. So for us, the, that's kind of the idea that we're looking at is, okay, you, got a, you have a crypto portfolio. How do you hedge the downside risk? CFDs are definitely one option. And then uh, you can uh, definitely buy on the upside as well. So you can capture both sides with the, the crypto CFDs. Um, Vlad, how, how do you get into trading for a firm? Any tips for traders aspiring to make it their full-time job? Uh, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw someone taking their wedding pictures the other day like at the golf course. I was like, yo, don't do it, man. You, you still got time. <laughs> yeah, I think Brad made the right decision by not going full-time into trading. Maybe if I caught that right. Uh, I think he got saved by Pitview. I think trading full-time is like, um, you have to really, really be prepared to do it. I think it's not it's not like this um, this lifestyle thing that people sell. You know, it's not like a place, a, tr a trade a day, go to the beach, drive the Lambo down the road type of thing. You know, when when you're trading for a firm, uh, it's, it's like being uh, abused. <laughs> Okay, abused is the wrong word, but I mean, um, it, it, it's a lot more um, tactical, I suppose, is the right word. Um, uh, you know, a lot of guys take the traditional route out of university. They'll go be, become like a junior analyst, whatever the case is, work their way up into into sort of like a PM position or become a trader or become a quant through that sort of route. Um, like if... My, my suggestion personally uh, would uh, to, to anyone and actually like I would I would do this if I could go back in time is to just be a prop trader for the rest of my life. Uh, it is very results driven, uh, you know, um, it is very sort of like target driven, but all you essentially need to do to become a prop trader in my mind or from my experience is to have a good verifiable track record, right? And uh, I'm not talking about the, the, the sort of like prop trading um, if you want to call it that offerings that they have on the internet now from the, the commercial standpoint i'm not going to name any names because i think i'll get into trouble um but you know it's sort of like those pay-to-play prop firms uh where you have targets to achieve before you actually get any money um <laughs> but for a legitimate prop firm that's backed by or that is run by a bank or a broker or to that extent i think they'll they'll uh they, they, they've got a shortage of good strategies uh, and they've got an uh, oversupply of capital um, in, in most scenarios. So anyone that that has a reputable track record that spans a decent amount of time, I would say two to three years, that's consistent, that can be audited, can legitimately go and market themselves on multiple platforms and get capital. And I think that's the easiest, most cost-effective way and most stress-free way of doing it, to be honest with you. Um, and that's the way that I would do it if I could get a retry in life. <laughs> that would be my suggestion. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess we're, we're on TradingView. Um, I'm going to just throw this one out. Um, do you use TradingView at all? And what are some of your favorite things to use when you use it for charting? Is this to me? Yeah, it's both of you. I'll start with you, Vlad. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know how to use TradingView at all. Uh, like, like I would not know what to do on TradingView whatsoever. Well, well maybe yeah. they can throw some of your indicators on there. Maybe. maybe <laughs> I, yeah. I, I have I have used TradingView, um, trading for a Malaysian hedge fund, and it's it's awesome. I really like it. There's a lot going on. Um, you know, you generally if you, you you have to pay for it to get really get out of it what you want, um, but they got every asset you could imagine. I, mean, I use it for analysis, some, analysis sometimes when I can't find a certain uh, a certain instrument. Uh, but I'm I'm like you know I mean I moan about MT4, but I use that most often to be honest. Yeah, it's just right there in front of you. It's right there. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's free. I mean, uh, I love C Trader. You're. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, C Trader is a beauty, and. I guess uh, I'm sure you've uh, you mentioned you're somewhat self-taught, Vlad, and like uh, being in the industry. Like, what what are some of your favorite books so that people can pick up and read? Uh, I'll start with Brad. <laughs> with I've actually never read a book on 
forex trading or analysis or, or anything. Uh, I've, I've never done that. Not that I don't read. I do read. Um, but I've picked up everything either by myself or, or on the internet. Um, and this is the thing when I, when I teach and, and do my videos, I think back to the days when I was learning on online trading and what, where I got confused and what my stumbling blocks were. So I'm always thinking about that. So, but answer your question. No, I, I don't have any books that I could recommend. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no books. All right. Vlad. Yeah. I'm going to do a bit of a promotion here. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Uh, I work with a great coach. Uh, well, you, I've worked with a great coach. His name is Jared Tendler. Uh, he's a, a mental game coach to, to poker players, but also traders, hedge fund guys. So the mental game of trading, um, Awesome. The guys helped me 1,000% in my trading career. Um, I think it's got uh, like I think it's got less to do with the actual strategy um, or, or reading books about strategies more so than uh, less than it has to do with like your actual mindset to trading and then your, your psyche and your psychology, um, managing those emotions like your fear, greed, intuition, all those types of things. I think that has a higher weighting to your probability of success over the long term than the actual strategy you use. I'm pretty sure, Brad, I mean, you've traded, Michael, I, I don't know, you probably see guys trading all the time. Um, even if even if two people trade the exact same system, they, they, their outcomes will be vastly different most of the time. And that pretty much relays back to their emotions or how they perceive the market or how they perceive their like, greed or fear and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that book um, and working with Jared has helped me a thousand times over. So I have to promote it now that you've asked the question. <laughs> but over and above that, um, nothing really. I mean, I, nothing that's interested me, like Brad said. I've never read a book on trading or strategies or anything to that extent. <laughs> that's how you get that garbage out of your head. You don't need it. Don't put it in your head so you can yeah. form yeah. your own yeah. opinion. Yeah. Um, Brad, I know you uh, do some teaching, mentoring. What does that look like um, for someone to get involved? Um, well, a direct contact with me. I'm, I'm actually in the process now of creating something more formal with a separate website, uh, a sexy URL, um, a <laughs> series of videos. But that's probably not going to be coming out until near the end of the year. I want to I want to formalize it. But right now, I'm, I'm mentoring various people, and I actually run courses for other brokers. Um, some last eight days, some last 10 days. Um, they're good fun. Um, you know, I get a lot of people saying, hey, and now I understand, you know, you've made it so simple. I try to boil things down to uh, the ultimate simplicity and uh, and steer people away from, from making it too complicated. So that's, do I say, what does the program look like? Um, very simple. I'm, I'm old school. I'm going to jump ahead to one of your questions. I'm old school. I, I have an order, of, I call it an order of analysis. I look at fundamental analysis, what's happening in the world, um, not necessarily with the news, but including the news. Then I look at support and resistance. That's critical, critical, critical. And I try to explain to students, support and resistance isn't just lines, it's where the banks have their orders, it's where those computers, it's where Vlad's computer is, is telling them to buy or sell. Uh, they're not there just for, for laughs. Then I look at chart patterns, whether it's double tops, triangles, rising wedges. Uh, and then I look at indicators. Um, literally stochastic oscillator is my go-to guy. You know, I, I know a lot of students may be a little more conservative, so they might be using MACDs or even parabolic SAR. I've, I've tried them all over the years and I keep coming back to the stochastic oscillator. And then I look at candle patterns. So I've got an order of analysis that I call with six, six tick boxes, um, which always, always, always starts with the fundamentals. I don't do anything unless you know, um, I know, you know, which way a certain currency is going because of their retail sales or because of there's a war going on or because of, of whatever. Um, and I go from there and I can't stress enough about support and resistance. So that's, that's what my program looks like in terms of actually teaching people and, and whatnot, um, how to trade. And, and as I say, I'll be formalizing all that with a series of videos and, uh, and a website probably by, by the end of the year, I hope. Nice. Nice. Well, I guess we're pretty much close to the end of the hour. I just want to throw it back to both of you, uh, maybe leave some final words for the audience. Vlad, I'll start with you. Final words. Wow. You can, um, you can you can you can pump something else, sell something else if you like. No, I mean I don't sell anything. Um, if anyone wants to donate money to me, I'm always happy. I'll put my uh, crypto wallet <laughs> up. 
Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've got nothing to sell. I mean, <laughs> it's been an interesting conversation. I mean, obviously, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer, but um, nothing, nothing from my end. Okay. Well, yeah, no, you're you're going on about how to get involved in professional trading, and it's it, it, it the thing is a lot of retail traders think they can trade their own money and 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 make a living. The the way to do it is to create a track record with a live account that shows a very pro progressive, nothing like this with crazy, um, gam as you know as you pointed out earlier, gambling and lots of wins and lots of losses, a nice steady track record, and then get investors or then then work for a company, um, or an existing fund. That's that's the way to do it. And you can trade other people's money. You don't have to worry about your own money. A lot of people psychologically can't trade their own money or some people can't trade other people's money. That's what, as you were saying, in, in terms of trading psychology, what you need to understand. Um, and a bit of self self promotion. If you want to find me, I'm on FX Street every Monday and Tuesday morning with videos. Quick 90 second, uh, what, what we call market blast to look at the markets. Monday's fundamentals and Tuesday's is technical. Let's just go on FX Street and... Uh, Plug in my name and you'll find me. Uh, or you can contact me, brad at fxlarge.com. Nice. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining. Brad, Vlad, and the whole uh, audience in trading view. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll catch you again soon. Thanks, Michael. Thanks.